Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about makeup. Now, that might sound like a weird topic for most people, but if you have grown up or been a part of a strict religious group, this may have been something that was an issue. And so what does the Bible say about makeup? Well, not much. <laughs> There's about three mentions and twice it's possibly alluded to, and we're going to take a look at all five of them. So the very first one is obvious. It's Jezebel. It's everyone's go-to. Uh, it's mentioned the story throughout First and Second Kings. She was a Phoenician princess who married King Ahab. He should have never married her in the first place. She was a Baal worshiper, and she convinced Ahab to worship Baal, which was idolatry for him because he had, was part of the Jewish people, and they had made a covenant with God that they would worship no other gods before him. And she opposed the prophets of God when she became queen and had many of them killed. She also had Naboth killed because he had a vineyard that her husband wanted and he wouldn't sell it to him. And so her husband went home and pouted and sulked and wouldn't eat because he couldn't get the vineyard he wanted. And so his wife devised this plan to uh, accuse Naboth of blasphemy and it worked and he was stoned. And so Ahab got what he wanted because Naboth was killed. So after loads of idolatry and a stack of dead bodies, she became the archetype of the wicked woman. And so <clears throat> if you read 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, by then Ahab had died. Jehu uh, had been appointed as the new king by the prophet, and you had him coming for her, and he was going to kill her. <laughs> he was getting rid of her. He was getting the the uh, idolatry out of the land and probably the leftovers from the previous uh, rulers. Then Jehu went to Jezreel. He went there to kill Jezebel. When Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup, arranged her hair and looked out of a window. Now, do you think her eye makeup or the fact that she arranged her hair had anything whatsoever to do with her wickedness? No. She was an idolater and a murderer. She was an evil, evil woman. And I mean, <laughs> that was it. It had nothing to do with eye makeup. And so, I mean, why did she do those things? Well, nobody really knows for sure. I've heard preachers say, oh, well, she was going to seduce Jehu uh, so he wouldn't kill her. I'm sorry. That just sounds like the opinion of a man who doesn't understand a strong woman. I personally don't buy for one second that she suffered from any delusions that she could convince Jehu not to wipe her out. She knew she had this coming. She'd had it coming for a long time. And I am convinced that she did it as an act of defiance. She just thought, I'm not going out sniveling in the corner. If you're going to kill me, I'm going to be dressed and ready. And, um, going out in a blaze of glory. And uh, that's exactly what she did. She went right out the window. So if you're going to pluck makeup out of that verse as sinful, then you're going to have to take a look at hairdos. And that will never happen in these religious groups because what you have is you have many of them who really promote hair and long hair, some of them even uncut hair. And so what you have is you have their ladies when they go to events, have these elaborate hairdos. And I mean, I'm not criticizing them. Some of them are beautiful. I mean, some of them are a little much, but whatever. It's personal expression and taste. But you can't take one without the other as a mark of her efforts to fix herself up. And if you're going to come at it from the seduction and vanity standpoint, the hairdo would be right in there too. It's hypocrisy to pick out one without the other. The second example of makeup would be Ezekiel 23, verse 40, and you have a parable, and it's speaking of the idolatry of Israel, and it's comparing it to spiritual adultery. They're cheating on God. And so if you read verse 40, they even sent for men to come from afar to whom a messenger was sent, and behold, they came. For them, you bathed yourself, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. So why would that be done? Well, to make yourself pretty, to make yourself attractive and appealing. And this would be another one where makeup and jewelry is plucked out as a sin. 
but everyone's still cool with you bathing. <laughs> you know, I don't understand why the whole bathing aspect doesn't just make it, you know, obvious that she was just getting ready and fixing herself up as pretty as she could be. Like people do fix themselves up. And so that's another one. The third one, and this is the last actual mention, is Jeremiah 430. And again, it's talking about the same thing. It's talking about Judah's adultery. So uh, it says, what are you doing, you devastated one? Why dress yourself in scarlet and put on jewels of gold? Why highlight your eyes with makeup? You adorn yourself or make yourself beautiful in vain. Your lovers despise you. They want to kill you. So again, this is another verse that's a sad excuse for making the sin here, makeup and jewelry. Because if you think it is, I hope you don't wear the color red or try to make yourself look beautiful either. And so what was the sin here? It's obvious. The sin was the idolatry. That was the problem. And they were cheating on their God by worshiping other gods. And they had already made an agreement in their covenant that they would have no other gods before him. So that was the sin. So the two that kind of allude maybe to make up are Isaiah 316. And this is another one. It's still talking about the same thing. You've got the adultery of Israel as Yahweh's bride. And it says, uh, the Lord says, now this is an interesting one. I, I actually really like this one. This is my favorite example. <laughs> Uh, the Lord says the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes. And the King James says wanton eyes. I kid you not. I heard a guy preach half of a sermon on YouTube about how wanton eyes were eye makeup and she was batting her eyelashes and being flirtatious and that that was proof that makeup was evil and sinful and seductive. Uh, strutting along with swaying hips with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Well, let's not stop there. Let's keep going. Let's find out all the things they had going on and how God punished them. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles, the headbands, the crescent necklaces, the earrings, the bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors, the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. What is this talking about? They were being punished by having the things they love, the pretty things, the things they use to make themselves beautiful, taken away for their whoring, basically. And so if the jewelry and makeup are sinful, according to this example, because God took them away, then so is beautiful hair because he made them bald, headbands, sashes, which would be the equivalent of a belt, perfume, nice clothes, purses, mirrors, linen clothing, and shawls. I don't even have to explain that. I think everyone watching knows how silly that all sounds. And then the fifth example would be Esther. And this is totally implied. But if you hit Esther chapter 2, verse 12, and it also mentions it in verses 3 and 9, it mentions these long beauty treatments that she had to go through to be presented to the king. So it says, before a young woman's turn came to go into King Yerxes, who was a jerk, she had to complete 12 months of beauty, beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. And so some people take that as makeup. I looked it up. It seems almost more like a skin treatment to me. And so it, it is kind of hard to tell. But queens obviously had access to makeup. I mean, Jezebel did and all those previous examples given of a woman making herself up for her lover. And so I'm just going to ask, do you honestly think that Esther spent a year soaking so she'd smell good, getting her skin made smooth and beautiful, eating the finest of foods, all for the purpose of making her beauty uh, beautiful? You actually think she walked in before the king without being decked out in beautiful clothes with makeup on and beautiful jewelry. I don't buy that for one second. 
So, you know, historically you had makeup traced back to ancient Egypt. So it was definitely around at that point. So is aspiring to be beautiful wrong? Well, 1 Peter 3, verse 3, and I'm going to, it's also mentioned in 1 Timothy 2, 9, and I'm going to do it in the King James for all you King James lovers. Whose adorning or source of beauty, let it not be the outward adorning, the plating of hair, braids, the wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. So what's that saying? We're supposed to go nude? The putting on of apparel. People love to take all this stuff just literally like it's spoken without looking into it or, or just kind of taking it sensibly. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so I would say this verse is talking about beauty, inward and outward. Don't let your whole focus be your outward beauty. Didn't say don't be outwardly beautiful. But let it be your inward beauty. Let that shine through as a believing woman. And so when you look at Genesis 2, 9, it says the Lord God made all, all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, I mean, you got to think God loves beauty. Look at nature. It's It's gorgeous. You look at all the colors and the variety and trees and flowers and, you know, just even all the different greens. You know, you have your grasses and your mosses and all the different leaves. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Obviously, God loves variety and he loves beauty. And when you look at people, you see the same thing. I mean, there's variety. We all look different. But then there's some very great beauties out there, too. And you just think, hmm. God likes it all. If you're worried that ma about makeup or nail polish or teeth whitening, plucking your eyebrows, I don't know, whatever you do to enhance your looks and to make yourself look as pretty as you can, don't. The Bible doesn't say anything negative about any of it as long as it is not your main focus. And as far as the pride and vanity argument, it's silly. I'll be honest with you. I have seen many of these legalistic women with their certain way that they look take way more pride and vanity in their look than I have women who wear makeup and jewelry. You have 1 Samuel 16, 7. You have God uh, looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. What was that talking about? Well, he had Saul. He was getting ready to get dethroned, and God had chosen David. And God basically said, look, he might be tall. He might be handsome. He might look the part. You might take one look at him and think, okay, he is definitely the king. But God didn't care what he looked like. He saw David. David might not have looked the part, but God saw David's heart. And so I would encourage you... Try not to let this stuff stress you out. Study it out. Read the verses and just, you know, again, here we are just trying to figure this stuff out for ourselves. So I always forget to say this. If you like my videos, uh, you can hit the subscribe and the notification bell and you'll get notifications when I post new videos. So anyway, have a great day.